Faith, said one person, is believing what you know isn't true. Faith, said one person, is believing what you know isn't true. We live in faithless times, if Gallup's to be believed. 1991 Gallup poll findings suggest that 69% of people thought that there are few moral absolutes. What is right or wrong usually varies from situation to situation. Stephen Brent of the University of California at Riverside in a new book has said that middle-class professionals remain relatively skeptical, he says, about moral certainties. A friend at the Southern Baptist Convention this last week even told me of a poll that was taken a few years ago among Southern Baptists that suggested 68% of them did not believe in absolute truth. Now, I think that's ridiculous. I think he was misquoting the poll to me, or I think the, the people being polled didn't understand the question. But nevertheless, in a day and in an era when you can have Christian ministers dismissing Christ, it is not surprising that faith is hard. That having faith in such faithless times is difficult. How can we do it? How can we have faith in such faithless times? What does it mean to have faith in times like these? Well, I don't know about you, but as I've been studying these final epistles in the New Testament that we've been looking at the last few weeks, I've certainly been struck by how contemporary they are, by how the problems we feel often are new problems or modern problems, in fact, were problems that those early Christians dealt with in these letters. And I think it's true again this morning. This little letter written by the brother of James and the half-brother of Jesus, the letter of Jude, is found on page 1,284 in your pew Bible. And let me commend it to you now, because I'm about to read it. 1,284, the letter of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who've been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring his slanderous accusation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind. Autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone 
and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear brothers, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupt flesh. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. From this little letter I want us to look first at what it says about faithlessness. And then at what it tells us marks the faithful life. And finally, I want us to look at what it tells us about a few of the most often asked questions about faith. First, what does Jude say characterizes the life without faith? Uh, this is what most of the letter is taken up with. It's this huge, long section from verse uh, 3 to verse uh, probably 19. Two things James, uh, Jude basically says... Two things, he says, characterize the life without faith. And the first thing which characterizes the life without faith is immorality. Look at verse 4. Note that one word, change. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. And when we go on and we read the letter, we see that these people are living brutal lives. They are living as if they're mere brutes, mere animals. In the verse 8, he says, in the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies. Verse 10, it talks about them understanding things by instinct. Verse 15, it talks about their ungodly acts that they've done. In verse 16, they follow their own evil desires. Down in verse 18 again, the prophecy that they were told that there would come those who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men, Jude writes, who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts. Now, these words, instincts, natural desires, are today very positive words. If we were writing something and we wanted to give a negative feeling to the person who reads it. We wouldn't use the word instinct or desire because people would assume that those things are innate, that they're born in us, and that they're somehow therefore very good. They're unreservedly positive today. Instinct. Desire. If it's natural. But look what Jude says. These men were teaching that you could live quite literally however you wanted to and be a Christian. Be in the church. And this, Jude says, is wrong. It is not true. I remember talking with one friend who had, was a full-time Christian worker and he had really fallen from the Christian faith. And uh, we were in a conversation at a place here in Washington and he was saying to me this and that and the other and I realized that at root he had no way to ever hear that God disagreed with anything that he wanted. And so I asked him, how will you ever know if something you want is wrong? Can you ever hear God? Is there any way in the way you understand things to hear God if He's against what you want? Friend, if there is no such way, if our world has deafened us to God by the den of our own desires, if we've become insulated from Him by the imperial sway we give to our own, intense impulses, then we, like these people here, become brutal, like the animals 
We cannot hear. We cannot learn from God. And yet here Jude warns these Christians about people whose lives were marked by just such brutish behavior. And Jude warns them because he suggests that behind this moral failure is actually moral rebellion. You see, the second thing which Jude said characterizes the faithless life. The first is immorality. The second is the denial of the truth. The denial of the truth. Look again at verse 4. This time, notice that single little word, deny. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. You see, at root, their brutal, impure lives come from their insolence and irreverence and rebellion. In a word, their impure lives come from their faithlessness. From their not having faith. From their denying the truth. That's what these middle verses that seem so strange to us are all about. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the things that seem strange to us. But verse 8 and following. In the very same way, these, dece- these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring his slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet, Jude writes, these men, these men in your church, speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Like Cain and Balaam and Korah, says Jude, these men have lifted themselves up against God's people, against God's way, and so finally against God Himself. That is what they've done. You see, Jude goes on to say here in verse 15, that the Lord is coming to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against Him, against God, because they've denied the truth. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves, Jude says. Again, they're exalting themselves to the position that's reserved for God. These men deny Christ and His people, slander angels, promote only themselves. No wonder Jude recalls the apostolic prediction made to these Christians. Verse 18, in the last times there will be scoffers. Scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the Spirit. This is the faithlessness that breeds such immorality as you read about in this letter. Such ungodly lives stem from the denial of God's truth. Moral faithlessness exposes our spiritual faithlessness. When all moral capital has been spent, our spiritual bankruptcy is revealed. So they not only taught that you could live however you wanted to live, but that you could believe whatever you wanted to believe and still be a Christian and still be in the church. And to this, Jude says a clear no, no, no. What you believe affects how you live. You can't maintain that you have a relationship with God, Jude says, and live as these men live. And as his conclusive proof, he says, what's the end of all of this faithlessness? It results, he says, in barrenness and punishment. Look at verse 12. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Uh, These love feasts were kind of a, a combination of a communion service and our potluck. Uh, That's what the love feasts were. In the early church, as far as we can tell, they hadn't separated communion out from a full meal. So there would be a time in the meal when they would gather together, when they would particularly take bread and wine, and they would remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and they would proclaim His death. 
Well, these men, says Jude, were blemishes. Or some of your translations may have rocks. But depending on how you take it, either way, they, they're marring this feast. In fact, they are dangerous obstacles to the church's fellowship. And Jude uses several images to describe them. Shepherds, clouds, waves of the sea, trees, stars. Now, all of these are pleasant images. Not a one of them is ominous. But kind of like a Hitchcock who likes to take things that are normal and scare us with them. Jude takes things that are lovely images that we have positive feelings about. Shepherds, clouds, trees, waves of the sea, stars. And he uses them to show the deceitfulness and the deception of these men. How they really are concealing their barrenness and corruption. So he says they are shepherds who feed only themselves. They're clouds, but without rain, blown along by the wind. They're trees, yes, but they're autumn trees, without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They're waves of the sea, but they're wild, foaming up their shame. And they're stars, but they're wandering. That is, they're falling stars. It's not just Jude's idea to say no to this whatever attitude. Faithlessness reveals itself as impotent and barren. A life not fed and guided by faith is like a shepherd who doesn't take care of the sheep. A cloud with no rain. A tree with no fruit. Such a life, Jude says, is without a sufficient purpose. It is as useful as a falling star. Faithlessness is about as productive for our lives, you know, as windlessness is when you're out in a sailboat. Without faith, Noah would have drowned. Without faith, Abraham would have stayed in Ur. Moses would have stayed in the wilderness. The Israelites would have stayed in bondage in Egypt without faith. And without faith, what would be different in your life? Without faith... What would be different in your life? Anything? These men, Jude says, are shepherds who feed only themselves. Clouds without rain. Trees dead. Waves that foam up their shame. Stars that are wandering. For whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. That brings us to the other result of their faithlessness. One is that it's simply barren, but finally it's their punishment. Because these men were so faithless... We get the idea that they probably didn't believe that they would ever be held accountable to God for what they did. Likely they taught this as part of their rebellion. But Jude's very clear to show that punishment is possible. Verses 5 to 7, Jude, like a good preacher, uses three illustrations. I want to remind you that the Lord delivered His people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home... These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Jude has said no to the immorality of of some of the people that he's writing to in this church because God has said no. So this punishment was not only a real possibility, Jude says that it was in fact what will happen to these men. They will be punished. Verse 8, in the very same way, these dreamers, they they followed these examples. How incredibly stupid. To have examples like this set out clearly of God's judgment. To know them and then live contrary to them. But that's exactly what these people did. They went on, ignoring these terrifying examples, not heeding them. But that's what these men have done. Indeed, that's part of what it means to be faithless. George Whitfield was renowned for being an incredible orator. He was an evangelist in the middle of the 18th century. At one point, he was in a, a drawing room of the Countess of Huntington. Lots of the nobility were gathered to hear him preach. Some famous skeptics were among them. At one point 
in the meeting. Whitfield was describing the plight of a sinner who's not aware of his sin. As a blind man on a stormy night, feeling his way along near the edge of a cliff. And as he told the story and tapped a cane as he walked forward and described the person getting closer and closer to the edge of the cliff, finally there was such intensity in the room that one of the most well-known skeptics of the room jumped up and said, Save the man, Whitfield! Save the man! Because he didn't want to see him fall over the edge. But Whitfield was interested in the real man who stood up. That was the man who was in this danger. The man Whitfield was telling about was imaginary. The man who leapt up was the real one who was in this danger. And that, says Jude, is the position that all are in. Who hear this warning and don't heed it. If we see these warnings that God has set down and we don't heed it, we're in the same position as that blind man feeling his way toward the edge of the cliff. That, says Jude, is our position. In fact, Jude looks at these people as so certain of destruction that he even says in verse 10, these are the things that destroy them. Verse 11, he even says, they have been destroyed. Seeing how certain the destruction of all people like that will be. And how can he be so certain? Because he even says it was prophesied. Verse 4, certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago. Verse 14, he cites another prophecy. Verse 17, still another. You see, this faithlessness should have come as no surprise to them. And it should come as no surprise to us. The prophecy applies for us just as it did for them. In the last times, there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. Well, that's what life without faith is like. And that's what Jude spends most of his time talking about. But not quite all of it. At the end of his letter, Jude returns to what really was his main theme. And that is the life with faith. What the life with faith should be marked by. And the main thing, it seems very clear from this letter, is for contending for the faith. Verse 3, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. That means once for all entrusted to the Christians. And Jude is writing saying to contend for it. Contend for the faith. Don't contend not about uh, the length of togas or whether or not hair is too short or too long. Or about the meaning of an obscure word or what color we should paint the catacombs. No, Jude's not writing them telling them to contend for any of those things. Jude is writing them telling them to contend for the faith. The faith that has once for all been delivered. That's final and unchanging. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is to be what they should contend for. And this word contend, it's a strong word. It's the word we get our word agonize from. It's an athletic word. Think of a sport that you like. Imagine a sporting event that you've seen live or on TV in the last week or two. If you've got a a favorite player, imagine how they looked at some points, straining with every nerve in their body, every muscle they had. That, says Jude, is what we're to be like in contending for the faith. Contending for the faith. I remember when I first became a Christian, I used to love that song, I have decided to follow Jesus, particularly that song, that that line of it, though none go with me, still I will follow. We must have a determination for the truth. And friends, I'll tell you that I have a determination for the truth, to contend for the faith once we're all delivered. In myself, first of all, but also with my family, with my friends and in this church, in our community and in our conventions of churches, and as God gives me opportunity in our nation and in our world. I haven't come here this morning to exhibit my knowledge or to dazzle you with my people skills as I greet 73 people immediately after the service to flatter you or to impress you, to satisfy the conditions of my employment by turning up on Sunday morning and preaching, or to be your personal spiritual trainer to help you accomplish all of your preset spiritual goals for the year. No, I have come here this morning to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So just as Jude was contending for the faith 
by writing to these Christians. So I am contending for the faith by speaking Jude's warnings and his instructions to you. And if you think it's important enough, let me encourage you to join me in contending for the faith. Don't be like the crowds that streamed out from Washington to watch the first battle of Bull Run. Probably enough Civil War buffs here to know about that. That At the first battle of the war, the, the, the largest sort of first battle of the war, streams of people actually went out from Washington. They spread their blankets on the ground and they served tea while the battle raged to watch it. A friend, don't let that be an illustration of you this morning. Don't spread your blankets and serve your tea while there is a faith to be contended for. Join me, join us in contending for the faith. And yet you have to know down deep if you're going to contend that contending is ultimately positive. It's not ultimately negative. If you're going to be faithful, there are negative aspects of it. There are things you have to say no to, like Jude does here very clearly. But the real climax of his letter is these two little verses, verses 20 and 21, where he tells them positively what to do. He says the life with faith should be marked not by division stemming from error, but by building each other up in the faith. Not building yourself up, but building each other up. We're the temple in which God dwells. And so we build it with our most holy faith on that foundation. So we have a concern for the truth. But that concern for the truth should lead to unity. In the scripture, it's error that brings division. We should work to build each other up in our most holy faith. Any tearing down, unless it's tearing down expressly for the gospel, is wrong. Can I say that more clearly? Let me try it again. Any tearing down, except tearing down expressly for the gospel, is wrong. We should build ourselves up in the most holy faith. The life should be marked not by an unholy carnality, but by a spirit-led prayer in verse 20. Pray in the Holy Spirit. You see, we see in verse 19, these false teachers didn't have the Spirit. But Jude says we Christians, on the other hand, are to pray as we're led by God's Spirit. If we're alive as individuals, as a church, we must gather to pray. This church, you know, was born out of a prayer meeting in a woman's home here on Capitol Hill in 1865. If this church is to continue to be on Capitol Hill, you must not just come to consume. You must come also to pray. You must come to pray for the work of God here in this place, that He will sustain it. Now, I have to say, since I'm addressing the Sunday morning congregation, I've heard a number of comments about the fact that we've had communion on Sunday mornings less frequently than we did. I've not heard one complaint about not being able to come and pray together because we don't turn our Sunday morning services into prayer meetings. Friends, Scripture nowhere tells us how often we must observe communion. Scripture is very clear that as Christians we must come together to pray as Christians. If you've not made getting together with other Christians, and particularly for the life of this church, a part of the priority of your Christian life, let me encourage you to do that. Because if this work must prosper, then it must be prayed to prosperity by the grace of God. This life should be marked, this life of faith, not by rebellion, but by obedience. That's what he means in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Jesus says, this is how you remain in my love, by obeying my commandments. And finally, this life should be marked by mercy, not by selfishness like these false teachers, but by mercy in verses 22 and 23. Mercy to those who doubt, mercy to those who are liable for punishment, mercy to those who are caught in carnal sin. We're not just interested in stopping the erosion, we're interested in actually starting the expansion by going out to show mercy to those who need to know of the mercy of God. So this is the life of faith. That Jude says, marked by contending for the gospel and building, by prayer and obedience and showing mercy. Now look at your own life. Can you put a check by each one of these things? Is your life a life marked by faith in these ways? Contending for the gospel, prayer, obedience. Looking at all of the ways that God has called us to follow Him by showing mercy and by obeying Him, by building each other up. 
Are you living a Christian life of faith? Well, we see here that faith comes from God. Three quick questions that Jude answers about faith. Looking to the past, where does faith come from? It comes from God. Look in verse 1. God has called Christians. The Father has loved Christians. Jesus Christ, God the Son, has kept Christians. I can exhort you to believe, but I can't give you faith. This faith that we're talking of comes from God. Looking to the future, though, who ultimately will say who's right? Once again, the answer is God. He's the one who's, we see in verse 6, keeping the angels bound for judgment. He's the one coming in verse 14 to judge the ungodly. And on the other hand, He's the one coming in verse 21 to bring Christians to eternal life. If we look to the future of faith, it's God who is the final judge and evaluator. And then what about right now? How do we keep on going and having faith in such faithless times? Look at those tremendous last two verses. To Him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. He is able to keep us from falling. As one Puritan said, as God did not at first choose you because you were high, so He will not forsake you because you are now low. As God did not choose you because you were high, so God will not forsake you because you are now low. He will keep you. He is able to present you before His glorious presence without fault and without, but with great joy. The very presence that Adam hid from, that Isaiah pronounced his uncleanness in the presence of, that Job fell down and repented in the presence of, that very presence will be presented in if we're His without fault and with great joy. The only God, our Savior. So, how do we keep going in faithless times? God. Only God. Faith comes from God. Faith will be judged by God. And finally, we keep going today because of God. He is the source and He is the judge and He is the sustainer of our faith. I used to enjoy hill walking in England sometimes. And it's very interesting that when you were far off, you couldn't see that there was actually a huge ravine sometimes. You would walk until you got very up to the edge and then you would see that you couldn't keep walking. Other times you'd see a cliff that looked impassable and when you got closer up you'd see there's actually quite a nice little path up. It depends on what position you were in, whether or not you were able to see that. Sometimes we need to change our position in order to see the truth. Augustine said, if we do not believe, we will not understand. Now, some here may need to work more on understanding. But there are some of you who have worked on understanding, have understood increasingly that the claims of Christ are true. And that you stand under God's righteous judgment. To you, I say, change your position. Pray to God for this faith that we've read about in Jude's little letter. As Jesus said, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Let's pray together. Lord God, we see in the faithlessness of some of these people, faithlessness reflected in some of our own lives. Too many of us here this morning can confess a however we want to live and a whatever we want to believe attitude. But Lord, we see here that the consequences of that are most serious. That they result in spiritual barrenness and impotency. And that they result finally in your judgment. And yet, Lord, we praise You for the hope that we have that comes from faith in You. We praise You that that faith is a gift of Yours, as Paul said. We praise You that You are the one who sustains that faith. And we praise You that You are the one who will ultimately vindicate that faith. Oh, Lord, we pray for each person present this morning that You would give us all the ability to repent and believe. Father, we pray that You would convict each one of us of sins. 
And for any of those who may not know God's mercy in Christ yet, O Lord, we pray You would show Your mercy very clearly. Show it as You did to the disciple Peter who confessed You as the Son of God when You then told him it wasn't that he that had figured this out, but that Your Father had revealed it to him. So, Father, we pray that the ministry of Your Holy Spirit in revealing the truth, convicting for sin and lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ would be present in every person's heart today. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen.